Thank you all for having me here this afternoon. I'm going to try and be succinct. I know it's getting towards the end of the afternoon and everyone wants a beer. Uh, but the, the real opportunity I saw this afternoon was to try and share with you guys how the DNA technologies have um, evolved or developed over the last few years and they continue to evolve very rapidly and I suppose uh, it's an opportunity for, for me to get some feedback from you all with regards to where you see the need uh, in your breed with, uh, with DNA testing and where we should be focusing our efforts over the next uh, year or so. So just briefly, uh, I'm going to go through a quick evolution of genetic and genomic technologies, uh, a bit of a revision of the types of DNA markers because I think that's important for understanding some of the issues with regards to what happens in the lab and the accuracies that you receive out of the different DNA tests you undertake. Um, the platforms that have become available for genomic selection and the use of SNP in parentage assignment. The migration of uh, the DNA database from microsatellite to SNP for parentage verification if you choose to go down that route. And an update on the poll test and I'm glad Cameron <coughs> brought up the issue of forms because um, there's a pretty easy solution to that. So I thought um, I'd just start by putting a bit of oh, oh. Yeah. Uh put a bit of a timeline together on some of the developments that have gone on over the last 30, 40 years uh, in the DNA scene. So uh, if you guys, uh, those of you who have been around long enough might remember that before our lab was the animal genetics lab, we were the veterinary blood grouping laboratory and we've been operating since 1964 when they used to do blood typing uh, for pedigree verification. And in the, so th that's been operating since the 1960s. Uh, AGBI was established in 1976 and about 10 years later in the late 80s we had uh, the discovery of DNA fingerprinting and the development of PCR which led to uh, the establish establishment of DNA typing for cattle in about the mid 90s, I think by 1995 um, DNA typing was really starting to ramp up. Um, by 2000 we had automated capillary sequences that replaced the old radioactive P32 gels that we used to do DNA typing on and from there uh, in the late 2000s things just have pretty much taken off. We have some other single locus tests that are available for cattle, uh, the CRC operating and delivering genomic equations in 2005 Genetic Solutions started up with their suite of tests um, and then in about 2007 the first commercial uh, next generation sequencer came online. So. Uh, after the human genome had first been sequenced, we then had the next generation of technologies where now you can throw $4,000 at um, Macrogen in Korea and have your genome back in three days. Um, and this is what has brought out all of the genomics technologies. In 2005, Affymetrix had, oh, this was pre-sequencing, but um, uh, 2005, we started with the 10K product from Affymetrix, then Illumina became very dominant with a whole host of bovine chips and gene seekers recently come out with specialised bovine products. So in the last kind of three to five years in particular, the choice of technology on the market to, uh, to implement genomic selection schemes has um, really blown out of proportion. It's hard, it's sometimes it's hard to focus where the best choice is going to be for your particular application. And so the types of DNA markers that we deal with uh, there's three main types that you guys really should be familiar with. The first one being microsatellites, and that's what we have historically done parentage verification with. That's when you get your DNA report with your parents on it. There's a whole bunch of numbers and letters up the top, and that's basically just your genotype uh, using the microsatellites. They, these are generally known as junk DNA. They are widely used in parentage and population studies, and they're highly, highly polymorphic, i.e. there's many forms. There's many different alleles at each marker, when you look across the population, and that's what makes them so useful for parentage testing. What you're going to be, well, what you probably have heard a lot about late, lately and more so into the future are SNP markers or single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, these are the ones used in genomic selection programs. We generally only have two alleles at each locus, so at each marker there's allele A or allele B. It's not like microsatellites where you could have 30 or 40 different choices at a particular marker. With SNPs, you generally have A or B. 
Um, and these are the one. Th these are some of the mainly the mutations that contribute to the variation we see in phenotypic traits. Microsatellite markers, they just jump repetitive DNA, they don't code for anything, they don't make proteins. SNP, if they're located in coding regions and genes, that's what that's where we get the variation that we see in our in our quantitative traits. And another quite important um, type of mutation are indels or insertion deletion events. And these are generally the mutations that are responsible for causing recessive disorders or diseases such as hypertrichosis or idiopathic epilepsy. Um, and they're often responsible for um, a quite drastic effect on the phenotype if they're located within a coding region of the gene. So they're the three main uh, mutations that we try and genotype and that we're trying to uh, consolidate really onto one platform moving forward. And no matter what the type of DNA marker is, they can either be a direct marker or an indirect marker. A direct marker or a causal mutation is the change in the DNA sequence that actually has an effect on the phenotype that you're measuring. Um, i.e. a recessive disorder, the tests for hypertrichosis and idiopathic epilepsy, we're actually genotyping the causal mutation. We're not, we're not trying to measure something nearby, that's what causes the change in the phenotype. Um, and indirect markers or linked markers are markers that are sitting somewhere nearby the causal mutation on the genome. We don't actually know the gene or the mutation that's causing, for example, in horned and pole. No one in the world still knows what causes horned and pole. They don't know the gene. They know it's sitting somewhere at the bottom of chromosome 1, and all of the tests available on the market use linked or indirect markers that are sitting somewhere nearby to infer the um, true genotype of the poll locus. And there's lots of tests on the market like that, and basically genomic selection is just um, a whole bunch of indirect markers. And we'll go into that a little. Yeah? Sorry, Emily, do you mind if we ask questions? No, no, of course not. Um, how do you track down these actual bits on the DNA that cause mutation? Like how, how is it you come across that actual bits of DNA? Uh, there's several different methods that are used, but one that you might be more familiar with with the BFCRC re research, for example, is that you have 2,000 animals, or you don't even need that many, say, say you're a recessive disorder where it's only one gene that's involved. Um, they basically jump genotype a whole lot of animals that they know are not affected by the disease, and a whole lot of animals that they think are carrying or are affected by the disease. With these SNP chips, that have markers all across the genome, uh, and then they do an association analysis basically between the genotype and the phenotype, and basically look for significant um, associations between the genotype and the phenotype, and it takes a long time. Uh, some of the single locus recessive conditions can fall out very quickly if it's only one gene that's affecting the trait, but in a lot of economically important traits, quantitative traits, there are thousands of genes that influence the trait and that's why the industry has gone down the path of genomic selection. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so, but with mutations, is it because it's only one piece of different DNA? I don't know if you're using your know, terminology. Yeah. That would make it easier to find instead of it being heaps of With the recessives? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's much easier to find a, a gene of large effect, I suppose. Uh, if that's what you'd like to call it, or the, the gene, the only gene having an effect, as opposed to when you have thousands of genes each contributing 0.5% of the variance or something, that's obviously very hard to narrow down. Um, and so, yeah, the type of marker employed for different genotyping situations um, is generally reflective of, of the complexity of the trait, um, and this then affect, uh, affects the accuracy um, of the result you're getting out of your genotype. Um, so DNA fingerprinting for parentage verification, most of you will have known, it's been around since the mid-90s and it's utilised um, microsatellite markers. It's superseded blood typing. And over the last 10 years, microsatellite panels for parentage verification have um, grown from nine markers to 12, 15, 21, and up to 32 markers if we need to. And so the technology's got better uh, the reagents we use in the lab have got cheaper, the processes have got better, uh, and the result you can get out of parentage verification or allocation in cattle has become more powerful. 
it's just the way tests evolve over time. Um, and Parentage historically has used microsatellites, um, which as I said earlier, are very polymorphic markers, um, and there's many alleles possible, possible in marker across the population. So just to demonstrate what we do when you send a sample in and ask um, it to be verified to a particular sire we have on the database, we extract the DNA from the hair follicle, we amplify 21 regions of the genome, they're just markers, we know where they are and we know how to find them. All of the grey bars across here, they're all the possible alleles that we've seen in the population at that marker, so there could be 20, 30, 40 of them. Each animal is only going to have two possible alleles. Um, and I thought I'd put this one up because this is how they used to genotype on radioactive gels before automated sequences came in in 2004. I'm glad I wasn't around for that. They used to have to develop them on the x-ray machine and read them with a ruler. It was very labor intensive, but uh, I think it's a good example of why $40 10 years ago got you a 12 marker microsatellite genotype and $40 now will get you a 10,000 marker SNP genotype to be used in genomic selection purposes. So uh, each animal will have uh, two alleles each. We're looking for alleles that are present in the calf. They have to have got one from the sire, one from the dam. That sire uh, has got alleles that's not present in the calf. We can exclude him. Sire one and, sire, uh, and the dam qualify and we go across that process across 21 markers on an exclusion based process and that's your parentage verification. And since then uh, we've had many individual tests come on the market um, for a range of selective traits or recessive conditions. Uh, first of all, we have Horn Pole. It's a microsatellite and it's an indirect test. Uh, then we have, we have Coat Color. You guys don't do much of that. That's a combination. There's a SNP that uh, there's a SNP mutation that causes the dominant black to the wild type allele and then there's an insertion deletion mutation that's the wild type true to the recessive red. And there, that's a, that's a direct test. Um, I won't read them all out. The Hereford sweep of recessive conditions are all insertion deletion mutations and they are direct markers. Uh, I believe EMAI has a woolly coat test under development. Then you get into the kind of tests that are offered by GeneSeq, tenderness, feed efficiency, there's all SNP markers and indirect markers. Um, and there's a whole host of these tests. They're all run individually. Um, so there's not no one magic platform that runs all of these tests. They're all run on different platforms by different providers. Um, and depending on the type of DNA marker, uh, we're going to use different techniques to <coughs> detect the marker. And there's three main platforms for genotyping. The first capillary electrophoresis, which does the microsats and indels. And a few SNP, so the F94L mutation we do for the limousins, we do that on capillary electrophoresis, but that platform's really no good for more than one or two SNP at a time. You then get the sequence on mass array for small panels of SNP that you might use for parentage or uh, genes, uh, GeneStar would use for their GeneStar assays. Uh, you can genotype 100 to 100, 200 SNP on that and some indels, and then you've got the Illumina B-chip genotyping, which um, is the basis of the genomic selection programs developed by BCRC. And these are large panels of SNP, and when I say large, anywhere between 10,000 and 800,000 SNP markers at a time. Uh, and you can get some indels to work on this technology. But really the challenge for our lab going forward is how to identify, uh, is to identify the tests that are really important to your breed and try and integrate them onto one platform uh, at the best price possible. There's lots of choices out there at the moment. All those in that list on the last slide, I can run all of them for you if you want, if you would like, but it would cost $150, $180. So the challenge at the moment is trying to integrate all of these tests onto one platform. So genomic selection employs the dense panels of SNP markers, um, and these are used uh, down at uh, ABRI. Uh, using the AgBoo software to basically augment or increase the accuracy of your classical EBVs. And John, I spoke to you about how that process would work this morning. Um, what, what my lab is focusing on is how the SNP information can be used for other purposes. It's not just genomic selection programs, but 
if you're paying $40 for a 10k genotype because you want to genomically uh, enhance CVV out the other end, then you should be getting heritage allocation and um, diagnosis of poll and recessives and stuff in that test as well. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be running a 10k genotype and having to go back to those individual tests uh, and duplicate genotype things. Um, the SNP that are employed for genomic selection are a combination of direct and indirect markers. Genomic selection basically works on the premises that you don't have to know the genes involved that affect the trait. You just have to be able to measure enough SNP that uh, one or two or more of those SNP are going to be in linkage with a gene that's affected in the trait and therefore you only have to know the algorithm to work it out. But I would argue that knowing the genes is pretty essential for some traits, particularly for um, for recessive disorders and selective traits like horn pole. I just had that last <laughs> uh, So the Illumina bead chip assays, uh, they're available in varying densities. Um, when I say 10K, that's 10,000 <laughs> SNP markers. The bovine platforms come in anything from 10, 50, 90, and 800k. Uh, commercial applications would be focusing on these three lower density platforms at the moment at $220 a pop. That's still very much a research tool, but as Rob Banks mentioned this morning, the prices are coming down. I disagree with Rob that it's going to be $20 in a few years' time. I don't think we're going to get that cheap for 10k. 10K is currently sitting at $40 a sample, and I can see it getting down towards the $30 mark in the next few years. Uh, but the, the truth of the matter is that when it comes to this technology, Illumina has an absolute stranglehold on the ag market. Until, and until we have some competition come in from Affymetrics or another provider, I can't see uh, Illumina budging much on that bottom price. The other thing is that uh, there's the price of the equipment and the chips to run the genotyping. But we've gotten to a stage where there's certain base costs involved in DNA extraction and labour in the lab. Uh, wages are not going down, they're going up. So we are reaching that bottom threshold. I agree with Rob that prices are coming down. I can see them get towards $30 for genomic selection purposes, but I can't see them getting much lower than that unless something drastically changes in the next um, few years. So our lab basically generates these genotypes. They're just a bunch of letters and numbers. Um, we pipe the, these down to breed plan and they're used um, to augment traditional EBVs. Uh, the, oh, yeah? What's the difference between a 10K and 800? How much more information do you get? Or is it simply that it's of a better quality? That's uh, eight times more information. So of a oh, oh, higher quality? Like is it a, oh. it's just more information? Oh, no, it's just more information, yeah. Um, exactly the same chemistry, exactly the same output you get out the other end. <laughs> What, when the data goes down to breed plan, what they actually do is if I give them a 10K genotype, they have parents genotype further up the pedigree, and they can basically fill in all the holes and make it into an 800K genotype with about a 99.5% accuracy at the moment. So you wouldn't bother paying for an 800K genotype. And the more parents they get genotyped at the higher density up the top of the pedigree, the better that imputation will become. Um, uh, and because we have 10,000 uh, markers here, we have ample data from which to do parentage verification. And not just parentage verification, but parentage allocation. You know, when you send your samples in now, you have to list who you think the potential parents are. Everyone hates nominating parents, I know. Um, uh, with, with this kind of data, it's really just let the machine pull the parents out for you because there's not going to be by chance an animal that uh, qualifies across uh, across 10,000 markers. Your parentage is going to fall out very easily. And we now have custom chips that contain specific add-on content um, to allow the diagnosis of pole and hypertrichosis and a few things along the way. Um, it was probably two years ago in Sydney we had a recessive diseases workshop. We were on the brink of the genomics era. Uh, we had all of these recessive conditions that um, needed to be genotyped as well. How are we going to get this all on the one chip? And about six months later, GeneSeq came out with the chip, so it saved us all a lot of work. 
Uh, at the end of last year, we had an uh, agreement in place with GeneSeq to provide these custom chips in Australia. Um, they're called genomic profilers, which is basically the base Illumina uh, marker profile, so the 10K or the 50K, and they've put additional information on it, what they call the add-on content. So they've got a whole lot, lot of proprietary tests, like um, the identity horn poll, a uh, whole lot of imputation markers, uh, they've got a big business in dairy, so they've got A2 and fertility markers and stuff on there. But for beef, they've also taken a lot of the John Beaver tests for Hereford and Angus, the recessive conditions. Pretty much anything that's in the public domain, red, black, coat colour. Um, markers to increase the efficiency of imputation up to 800k. Uh, and they've put them all on these, these chips, and the 10k one is what's $40. You can get a higher density one at 90k for $80. Uh, and the additional content that would be relevant to Herefords mainly at the moment would be the uh, extra markers to improve the imputation accuracy up to 800k. Um, there's an identity poll product which I'll talk about more in a little bit and then the three uh, John Beaver Hereford recessives. So anyway, mm. we send the hair sample in now to getting $50 if we get a test you know, Which one of those is it? So, oh. $50. Yeah, the, 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 the University of Brazil do a new no case. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know what you get paid for it. We pay $50. <laughs> yeah, that's about right. Um, so which one of those is it? And, and is it going to have enough data on it to link in what all the weight here in the Yeah. Is that the GGP that they're getting for 50 bucks? I would assume so. Yeah. I assume so, yes. Oh, where's Rachel? Rachel. No, she's gone. Oh, she's gone. I'd, I'd say it's a yeah, the fifty dollars your standard parentage, which you're getting the microsatellites for, is yeah. mid twenties. Is that the so the fifty dollar one at the moment? I don't know if we're doing any testing on. Is that I don't know exactly what you're sending in there? <laughs> What's your name? Phil. Phil. Yeah, we've had a few GGPs come in uh, with the add-ons for Hereford. Uh, and that's that's the ten that's the ten k product, and that certainly can be used downstream into what Rob and Jono was speaking about this morning. Herefords don't currently have anywhere to store that data, but we're just hanging on to it until they upgrade their database, and it can all get shipped down to ABRI. <coughs> oh, it just happened. Cool. Um, hey. There'll be a big email that much. Oh, sorry. Uh, anyway, I, my point is, we we do we are working towards a platform that uh, can, one one assay can provide uh, can provide data to breed plan parentage and recessives. You do not you do not get this add-on content for free. There's a whole bunch of public content. Um, coat color. I think they're letting when I say they gene seek, they're letting. Uh, Alpha manisidosis, the imputation markers, tenderness markers for Bos indicus and stuff. There's a few things that you do get for free, but these these tests, the identity test, is owned by Texas A&M, and these are owned by John Beaver. So you're not going to get them for absolute free, but I think you get them for around the ten or twelve dollar mark. Yeah. Is that on top of the forty? On top of the forty dollars. Yeah. Um, Okay, but um, how am I going for time, John? Uh, how much time? How much more? Oh, uh, I'll be I'll be brief. Um, Five minutes. Yeah, okay, I'll be brief. <laughs> so um, some bre some breeders may not want to pay forty three dollars just for parentage verification. So we're going ahead with developing small panels of SNP. This is basically with the view that in three years' time, the breeders embrace genomics. All of your registered sires of registered calves are being genotyped with ten k, getting fed into your genomics program. You don't want to double genotype them. Uh, because you're still doing PV on microsatellites, so we're developing a small panel of SNP just for parentage verification. Um, ISAG, is, ISAG is the International Society for Animal Genetics has recommended 100 SNP for parentage. Um, we've done some simulations with CRC data and the pretty ordinary 81% allocation of mating pairs, um, but it's indicated that 150 markers would work quite well, uh, and so we 
have selected our top 500 markers that should go into that panel basically to select a final panel of 150 SNP for parentage, which will be the same cost $25 or whatever it is now for parentage verification. That price will go down over the next couple of years as we get to run the panel a bit more. Um, and we're moving some of these recessive and single lockers conditions just to run in a small assay alongside this SNP parentage panel. So you've got these large parentage panels on the gene seq profilers that feed into your genomic selection programs and the smaller, pro smaller panels that just do parentage and a couple of recessives or something that run alongside uh, so you still have the option of not going the whole hog if you don't want to. Um, so I had in here a few options for migrating the parentage database from microsatellite to SNP. Um, you may have heard through BTLG and a few communications, there's been some ideas tossed around about how to handle the migration. Those of you who went from blood typing to DNA typing might remember it's a bit of an expensive and laborsome process to change the whole pedigree over. Well, now we're going from microsatellite to SNP because you cannot use a microsatellite profile. Well, a parent that's been done with microsatellites and a progeny that's been done with SNP, they're not interchangeable. Parents have to be on SNP and the progeny have to be on SNP. Uh, so there's been a few ideas that are tossed around. One's been the imputation of SNP, of, my, of SNP, oh, either way, imputing SNP profiles from microsatellite profiles or by, vice versa. So I thought I'd just <coughs> touch on that briefly. Um, one option is just to draw a line in the sand and re-genotype all your active parents. Another way <coughs> is to estimate the SNP genotype from the microsatellite genotype. Um, I think for Hereford this is probably not really necessary. The, the pros of this method is that you don't have to shell out up front for regenotyping costs of parents. The cons of this method is that the cost of the software to develop the imputation algorithms will be about $30,000 and then you've got maintenance costs on top of that. The real con I see is that you're going to lock your calves into a 10k minimum genotype for parentage verification if you go down the imputation route, um, which, which is a $40 parentage verification basically. So if you can't see any value coming out of the genomic predictions on a 10K, you don't want to be paying $40 for parentage verification. Um, and, and that's because we're using the microsatellite genotypes um, to infer the SNP genotypes, and you need a much larger panel of SNP in the progeny cohort to then parent verify back. It's just locking yourself in and I don't think it's a terribly good um, good path for Herefords to go on, go down. I just thought I'd touch on that subject because it's been tossed around a bit at um, things I've been in. Sorry John, I'm hurrying. That's all right. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, lastly, I thought I'd just give you an update on the poll test. I'm glad Cameron brought it up. It's been something that's front and centre at our lab lately uh, and I suppose for for a, for a problem that seems to be looming, uh, there is a relatively easy solution. <coughs> easy solution to it, and I think Herefords are very well placed to um, to to get around the pole horn problem because you have such a large cohort of animals from which to choose from. Um, if my memory serves me correctly, I think there's equal representation of pole and horn in the top kind of EBV genetics in the breed, um, unlike Brahman where you've probably got 3 or 4% of the breed would be homozygous pole. I don't have a large pool to select from, but, but you guys do. Um, in 2010, the BCRC released the pole marker. It was developed for Brahman, subsequently tested in other breeds, um, including Hereford. It's an indirect marker. As I said earlier, no one knows what causes horned and pole uh, in cattle. They know it's just somewhere down the end of chromosome 1. And we have this microsatellite marker that's sitting close by. There's one allele of that microsat that seems to be uh, usually always associated with pole at the pole locus, and therefore is informative of pole status. Um, the accuracy varies for the test between 90% uh, in Brahman. The limos have given up on it for obvious reasons. Uh, but in Herefords, uh, the accuracy is okay. Uh, that, that's actually because from later work that we've done, um, which I'll talk about in a second, it's quite obvious the Brahman got most of their polling from the Hereford breed back in the day. And for that reason, it still works quite well in Herefords. When I talk about the accuracy of this test, 
it's it's not I give you a result of PP and there's a 75% chance that that's going to be correct. It's the ability of the test basically to discriminate between homozygous pole and heterozygous pole animals. Uh, if I give you back a result of PP, there's a 99% chance I know that that result is correct. What this is saying is that 75, only 75% of the time can I give you a result that definitely says PP or PH. Yep. And Leanna was just wondering, um, have you got, have we stopped looking for that uh, direct gene now? Is this good enough going to mark the around it? Or? I think the, the hunt will always continue. Um, Rumour has it the Texas A&M group think they've hit it on the head, but that was actually 18 months ago and I haven't seen the paper yet. Um, uh, no, I think the search will continue, and if we can get direct markers for it, not particularly in Bostaurus breeds, I think the, um, we're developing the test a bit further, and uh, I think once the new version of the test is launched later in the year, I think for Bostaurus breeds that is good, because the inheritance of horned and polled is much less complicated in breeds like Hereford than it is in the north. Uh, in Bos Indicus breeds you have the uh, Skur and African horn gene that seems to uh, interfere with the test results a little bit, and for that reason, I think it'd be really good if we could nail some of the causal mutations contributing to the trait. Um, the last six months or so, I've been working with CSIRO on developing this test further into a multi-marker haplotype test. It's going to contain between seven and ten markers, and the preliminary results of scan this over close to 2,000 animals across five breeds. Hereford is included at the moment, and the early results look really good. Basically. The test almost always can discriminate between PP and PH animals. Um, the test will, the test price will remain the same, but it's still a microsatellite based test, which means there's no way microsats are going to run on the Illumina platform uh, or, or the Seekonom platform. It's a completely separate test, and as long as there are separate tests, you're going to be paying $40 for your 10k genotype and 2640 for your poll. Um, so ongoing research is really to, to identify some SNP haplotypes that can sit on the end of the SNP uh, or the genomic tests. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's another poll test available from Igenity. This is a company that used to be Meriol. It's now owned by Neogen and it sits alongside the GeneSeq um, laboratories in the United States. They hold the rights to the Texas A&M test, which is a multi-marker SNP haplotype test. Um, the accuracy of this test is about $95 and the cost is $45. Um, if you want a 10k genotype on the genomic profiler for $40, you can have it for an additional $30, but it's still uh, quite an expensive test. What we're really aiming for uh, is to have a look in the region, see if there's any other SNP. The problem is Texas A&M is sitting on those SNP under a patent, we can't touch them, so we're going to look and see if there's anything close by that we can use or else look to license the markers off Igenity, uh, hopefully for a more reasonable price than $30 a pop. Um, and the next stage of the project with CSIRO is to determine whether this is feasible, because really what I want to see, not just for you guys, but for the northern industry in particular, is a 10 kg in a type for 40 bucks, and then uh, a horn pole at uh, 5 to $10 on top of that, depending on whether we have to pay licensing fees to Igenity. Um, so just in summary, DNA technologies have changed quite rapidly over the last 10 years. Um, you guys would be feeling the brunt of that just as much as we are. The genomic technologies present an opportunity to increase the rate of genetic gain, but we really need to think hard about what the priorities are and how we're going to integrate the platforms so as to deliver tests to you guys um, at the best price possible. Um, and basically research uh, into ways of increasing the accuracy, the throughput, uh, and the integration of these tests is continuing. So I'd like to really thank you all for having me here this afternoon. Um, sorry I skipped over a few things, John, but I'm... Um